There we are. Okay, and we're gonna, I'm gonna share my screen, but I wanna say welcome this morning to part two of mental health and next level Christianity. And uh, we're gonna go over to a PowerPoint here so we can have some pictures while we talk. And let's see here. Um, We are recording now, good. Okay, slideshow. There we go. All right, everybody see that in front of them? If you don't, we'll be talking about it. But I found a book in my Kindle and I just wanna to mention it. If some of you would like to read about this because I think the authority of the believer and what we actually have even those who have written books on the topic say we're still discovering this where we believe there's even more than what we've studied that we actually are limiting ourselves quite a bit and so there's a book called knowing what belongs to us by kenneth hagan and his last name is h a g i n i'm going to highly recommend you guys read this i'm going to read as a beginning prayer for us to focus on. We'll say amen at the end of this. Um, but he starts out with Ephesians 1 3. And I want to just read this for a moment. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. And of course, we're here on earth, but he's already blessed us past tense with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. So what kind of blessings are those? And, and that's what we're going to discover here. There are things that come from a spiritual place, but they're available for us now. So this is his comment. And it's kind of fun to read this. Christians have been blessed with an inheritance in Christ. Everything that Jesus Christ bought and paid for at Calvary belongs to the Christian now. That includes all spiritual blessings in Christ, yet many Christians don't know that all spiritual blessings are already theirs. Instead, by prayer and believing God, they keep trying to get what already belongs to them. That's pretty profound right there. Christians who are not appropriating what is theirs already by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus are missing out on their full inheritance in Christ. And he's talking about more than salvation here. Not only that, but if they keep praying for what already belongs to them, they are not walking in faith because they are not believing and appropriating God's provisions. The Bible said it's impossible to please God without faith. You see, in his great grace and wisdom, our wonderful Heavenly Father has already given the church everything he knew we would need to make us richly endowed, strong for any battle, or conquest against the enemy, and victorious over every circumstance. And uh, this is a very uh, thought-provoking book. It will provoke you to think about, are we suffering things in this world because we haven't realized what's ours for the taking already. So I'm hoping today that can all be our prayer, that we pray that um, we can really have our eyes open in, in wisdom and understanding on what God really has already given us. And, and in one of my books, I said, it's kind of like growing um, food in your backyard. You have a backyard full of tomatoes and blueberries and all kinds of things, and yet you're in the house praying for the tomatoes and blueberries to appear on your table when all you have to do is walk out there and pick them. They're there for you already. So we want to be patient with ourselves, of course, because we know that um, we're all in process of discovering what these things are. So sometimes we find that we have a circumstance in our life and we're not having victory in it. Don't be, don't be hard on yourself there. Sometimes we just haven't discovered the tools for that yet. And so I'm hoping that if any of us are struggling in an area and we're, it's depressing us or upsetting us somehow, that we can call each other, have each other 
um, support us and give us tools that we may not have yet discovered or that we might not know yet. And you're welcome to email me. I'm certainly not the expert on everything at all, but I have been on a journey for this because I really enjoy the idea of Christian empowerment, that we don't have to be victims to life and circumstances. And we can really live in such a way, we're always going to have stuff come at us, of course, we live in the world, but we want to live in such a way where we go, okay, that challenge is coming at us. What tool do I need so I can have victory over that? So we can walk in this, in this way, and it's going to make our walk very exciting. And that's what I really love about this is this was meant to be an exciting, challenging, growing situation that fills us with joy as we become these conquerors over things. And it becomes an alive thing. And we start seeing miraculous provisions of the Lord as we enact some of these things. So that's my prayer for all of you today and for myself as we go. And I love picking out promises and reminding God of what he said, because there is a verse that says, put me into remembrance. And so here's one today, Psalms 34, 7, it's on your screen. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Another way to say that is who respect him. And he delivers them. What if you're in a situation and immediately you say, Lord, I want to bring you into remembrance that your angel is encamping around me because I respect you and I follow you and I expect and I agree with that deliverance. That's how you activate these promises towards you. God is very respectful when you remind him of his words and promises. He asks you to actually do that. So taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And that's an action step. Um, I don't automatically necessarily take refuge in the Lord. I have to say, I have to make a decision. I am going to come under the shadow of his wings. I am going to take refuge in him. And I want to remind you, I should put these pictures up on the screen. Maybe I can do it next week. But I have a picture of my daughter's place in South Carolina, where a tornado was coming through. And I think I might have mentioned this on an earlier broadcast. And she literally went into prayer with her family, putting their home and property under the refuge, under the wings, under the protection of God. That tornado came so close, it uprooted large trees in the neighbor's property. They were uprooted. I have the pictures of them. <clears throat> they're laying on their side with their big roots up and these are huge trees my daughter's place had easter eggs the little plastic easter eggs on the deck not one of them had blown off and none of the blossoms on the trees had blown off and this was next door so she she took an action step and a step of faith she not only got together with her family and put their house under the refuge and wings of the Lord, but she called her Bible study group in California and asked them to come into agreement with her. And that was the result. And I totally believe God honored that. He honored the fact that she brought that to his remembrance. And, and he partnered with her when, when, when she did that. So I'm going to challenge you all to have some of these scriptures on hand, even if you have to make a a picture and put put it in your picture put all these ones that you want to have at your disposal because you know sometimes when something happens we can't think of it right away because we haven't really made that a part of our mental thinking pattern or our, our emotional thinking pattern just yet so don't wait for a tragic thing to come along have as you read the scriptures write some of these down and have them for yourself and always keep in mind, we want you to not be self-condemning in any way. If you feel like, oh, I wish I would have known that, or then this wouldn't have happened, or I feel bad that I did this or that. Keep in mind, we all come into this world living by man's perspective. And it's a growth experience to get to a point where we're living from God's perspective, where we have more of that supernatural power in our life. So we're all on this little red line that I have. We're all somewhere on it, just like kids learning to walk. Kids learn to walk. If we had a, a room full of um, one-year-olds, some would be walking, some would still be crawling, yet we encourage each one of them to 
to keep on going. And, and we never tell a child who's learning to walk who falls down that, oh, guess you're not going to learn to walk, you know, and don't say that to yourself, please. Okay. So here's a quick review. I always like to bring these back to our mind that God definitely has a treasure chest for us. And I think we could read through it our whole lives and still not come to the end of how these treasures can be applied. And these are the scriptures of promise. We know there's over 3000 promises in the scriptures. So that's a lot. Um, we've been given a measure of authority and are empowered to use it. That's fascinating because many, many people come to life at kind of a, a a place of victimhood where, you know, I just have to take what life throws at me or I have to um, be okay with my circumstances because the circumstances are ruling me. And um, we don't have to be like that. We can actually take some authority and we can shift the atmosphere and shift our circumstances. We have some power to do that by speaking God's word and promises over those circumstances. Think of it like hitting an ice cube with a hammer. The ice cube is your circumstances. Take out the hammer of God and start hitting that thing and that thing will break up. It might not break up today, but it'll, it'll chip off. So we, we want to start doing that. Our faith-filled words are powerful weapons for good or evil. So we want to speak these things out loud. They're powerful. Remember the glass, that boy breaking the glass with his voice. Um, think of that as your circumstances. You can break up your circumstances by speaking faith-filled words. And it might take a little time, but every time you do it, God's word never returns void. Remember, it never returns empty. Do not speak negatively of yourself or others as words imprint on water. You're 80% water. What are you speaking to yourself? Hopefully from last week, you're speaking great things to yourself. Do not curse yourself or others. That's where we tell each other who we are is negative or what we're doing will never or ever or be able to. And we don't want to put those on other people or ourselves. If we believe those, a program will form in our brain and in our heart and we start to follow that program. Some of us, and I'm, in fact, I'm going to say all of us have some of these negative programs because you can't get through life without people pushing you down in some way and telling you, you never, or you won't, or you can't. And we've all had that. And I, I really hope we start as that, as God brings that to our mind, those old programs that we raise up and we actually condemn those programs, we revoke those programs, we rebuke those programs, and we just crush them with our words and say, no, that's no longer a part of me. I, I reject it and command that mountain into the sea like the scriptures say. When you speak the word of God over situations, and I already mentioned this, it's a way to shift the atmosphere and cause change. And we can always say if we're in the presence of an authority figure, we want to be respectful to authority figures, but it's okay to say, you know, you may say this, but my God says this. And um, we can do that and say that with the utmost of respect. But it's important not to let words settle on us without any, any rejection of those words. So the sooner you say, no, I'm not going to accept that, just like I was with my friend at a doctor's and he made a blanket proclamation that by 70 everybody gets cataracts yeah. now I could have just stayed quiet and said oh yeah okay whatever that's interesting you know but I didn't I spoke up immediately and I said I don't accept that I don't accept that I take good care of my eyes I do things for my eyes I take beta carotene I I do, I actually speak over my eyes and do things like that. I didn't go into everything with him. But immediately when I said I don't accept that, he looked a little embarrassed, um, like he maybe overstepped. And uh, because, you know, he knew he put something like that out. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to mute, if you would, because I'm hearing background noise. So if you're able to do that, we'll uh, unmute when you want to say something. That would be fine. But I didn't, I, I've really learned that I'm not going to take something and let it sit in my head or on my body that somebody spoke out without respectfully saying, no, I'm not going to accept that. And I did it with a smile, you know, I did it with politeness, but it's important that our brain hears us reject 
words put on us because our brain and our body are kind of like kids. They're, they're sort of programmed to accept the words of authority. And we really want to watch for not letting that settle on us. Believe God more than what you see, hear, or feel. Scriptural, spiritual thinking versus the carnal mindset. So if God says something, if he says nothing's impossible for me, we don't want to look at a situation and in our mind say, ah, impossible. This person is too mangled up, too far gone, to this. And a lot of people, when they see that, they'll all agree, like somebody in a car accident, maybe there's something happened. And um, it reminds me of a Thurman Scribner whose granddaughter's brainstem was severed in an accident. And of course, the doctors all grouped around and said to, said to him, she's on a respirator. As soon as we take her off the respirator, she will become deceased. And a lot of people would say, okay, doctor, well, let me go in and talk to her one last time. They agree. That's an agreement. Thermos Scrivener said, you don't know my Jesus. And he went and he used some scripture. And he spoke that scripture out in the hallway, he had a little talk with God, he came back to the doctor and he says, you take her off the respirator and there is not a chance she will become deceased. I guarantee it. How many of us would be bold enough to say something like that? Do you know that little girl's alive today? I've got the video footage of her riding a horse, absolutely whole in every way. It's amazing, even the doctor says, somebody bigger than me put that little girl back together. But Thurman never once agreed, came into agreement with what the doctor said. He decided to take a stand, and it was a very bold one. And this was a man who really had grown very high up in his spiritual belief and authority. He taught a healing school, teaching people how to take authority over things. So um, it's amazing his story is amazing. I'd actually like to find it and show it to you for the end of this series so you can watch it. It's about a 20 minute clip. We'll think about that. <clears throat> the last sentence here, let the weak say I am strong. What if on the way to work every day or while you're working out or taking a walk, you would say boldly, I am strong. And you would say it about eight times. Okay, just so your brain gets it, just so your body gets it. And I'm going to kind of broaden this out a little bit, but when we say these types of words, when people are hooked up to the biofeedback machine, the machine shows that change is going on in their body. You know, when I bought my biofeedback machine, I forked out $20,000 for that machine. It's an amazing machine. I don't regret it at all. But what if inside of you was a $20,000 biofeedback machine? Because this machine treats. It treats the body with frequencies that break up those ice cubes of patterns that we don't want. What if your voice and what you say could break up those patterns just like my machine? In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually say to all of you, I believe you have a $20,000 biofeedback machine that treats with frequencies inside of you and it's your voice it's your voice speaking over your body and speaking scriptural and spiritual truth and that you have much more power over your body than you might believe so let's look a little bit we'll get into our lesson today this is a brilliant brain development and we are so fearfully and wonderfully made and uh I need somebody to mute whoever is pouring water. It's okay. I'm glad you're getting water, but we can all hear you. So if you could just mute that, that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, in our brilliant brain development, this is a part of how fearfully and awesomely we are made. And I want to share something with you because we have a great power with our words and our encouragements over children because of how their brain is made. And perceptions actually start in the womb. There's a lot of imprinting on our children that happen from the mother being fearful or courageous or anxious or peaceful or joyful or depressed. These all start imprinting actually in the womb and they're finding that out. The, um, biologists are finding that out. From age zero to two, a young child's brain is primarily delta waves. 
That means high intake, low response. What does that actually mean? <clears throat> it's very much like an adult who's under hypnosis. When you're under hypnosis, you have a high intake. People can say a lot of things to you when you're under hypnosis and you don't reject any of it. You don't disagree with it. You just accept it. Low response means very low rejection of whatever is said. So whatever you say to a child between the age of zero and two, they believe it, they accept it, they let it imprint upon their brain and body with no rejection. So here's your chance. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been talking a lot and I tell you it's uh, showing a little bit here. <clears throat> So when a child zero to two, if you say you are such a good boy, what a helper you are. You have the best parents in the world. And you know what? You're the best little boy in the world. Of all the little boys or girls I could have received from God, you are the best. You are always so good. I love how you are such a helper. Look at how you're picking up. You do such a great job. You're so neat and clean. You know, you're so complimentary. I can tell you really love your mother and your dad. You know what you're doing with this child? You're programming their brain. I know this sounds funny, but it's kind of like we're brainwashing our kids between the age of zero and two, because whatever we tell them, they believe. This is the perfect time to tell them they're godly, they're blessed, they're full of faith, they're so confident, they're so artistic, we love how they love music. Oh my goodness, you exercise. I know you love exercise. Look at how we can start these kids off with an amazing foundation. This is an incredible time. It's a very powerful time as a parent. Or we can tell that child they're a bad boy. They're no good. What's wrong with you? You're so bad. You know, we can do that too. We gotta be careful because they believe everything you tell them and they reject nothing or very little. So this is an incredible opportunity time. If you're a parent or a grandparent or you're a neighbor or you're a friend to children or you're a Sunday school teacher, make it a point to tell that child what you want them to be or tell them as if they are already are that. Like you are so confident. So if a child says, I'm scared, well, let's check it out. But you know what? Inside, I know you have a lot of courage and strength, okay? God calls the things that aren't yet as though they were, and we need to do that too. Age two to six, the child is primarily in theta brainwave. That's twilight reverie. That's where they daydream a lot. They have a lot of fantasy. So when you see a child making a mud pie, and you say, what are you doing? And they say, oh, I'm making a mud pie. In their mind, that is a pie. It truly is a pie. If they're riding a stick horse or a rocking horse, in their mind, they're, they're riding a real horse. If, now, here's, the, here's the, the problem with this, this stage. We turn on the television, there's a violent movie on. There's blood, there's guts, there's stuff going on. And the child's sitting right there with us. They're not objecting. They're not stressing out too much. Their eyes are glued on the TV. And we turn down and we, we turn to them and say, that's fake. You know that's not real. That's just ketchup on them. Okay? But in a kid's mind, that doesn't work very well at this age. Or if you tease them really badly and then you say, oh, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. To them, it's real. The stuff on the TV is real at this age. It's hard for them to say, oh, this is real and this isn't real. Everything is kind of real to them. And they may not say anything in response. We might think, oh yeah, they can watch that violent thing or that scary movie with me or whatever. But in their mind, that's real. Just like the monster under the bed. He's real, he's there, okay? This is a time where kids don't differentiate. We have to do a lot of protection of children at this age from the television and from joking where we're trying to scare them and we say, oh, that's not real because they can't comprehend that at this age. So please protect children very much so at this age. Alpha consciousness at age seven, they're starting to grow more and more to be conscious of things and to know what's real and not real. They're starting to learn a little bit here. 
<clears throat> then at age 12, they're beta focused learning where they're able to sit still more in class. Before this age, kids actually learn better when they're moving. So if I can move and learn at the same time as a child, I actually learn a little bit better. That's why it's to learn in a classroom where children are seated for long hours. That's a little bit difficult for some children. My daughter's a teacher <clears throat> and she took me into a classroom um, where the teacher was brilliant. I thought this was brilliant. These kids were second graders and each child had knitting at their desk. They were all had a square of knitting and knitting needles or a crochet hook. The knitting wasn't perfect by a long shot and the kids were out at recess, but that's how they allowed the kids to move and to learn at the same time. And it kept the kids from all this fidgeting and having trouble focusing because they were allowed to have this movement. So um, very much a part of how their brain works. Kids are made to move and learn at the same time until about age 12, where they're much more able to sit and focus. So that's a little bit of brain development. It's kind of a really interesting part of how we're made but it, it shows how much power a parent really has in shaping their children. It's never too late. If you, if you, if you made a few mistakes there, as we did, um, know that you can keep speaking into your child's life and speaking life to them and truth to them and their brains can start to move toward that. So it's never too late. It's never too late for us as adults to get rid of some of this old programming and put in new. Rational thought can suffer when our nutrition is poor. And this is kind of a throwback to the first two weeks, but energy becomes channeled into the lower brain functions when our energy is not right. If we're existing on energy drinks, we're skipping meals, we're eating a lot of sugar, our brain's the first organ to suffer in our entire body. And the, the energy will actually go to the lower brain, to our survival brain. It will actually leave the frontal part of the brain, which is our rational and reasoning brain. And that's why we see people sometimes, they're living on junk food, they're stressing themselves, they're missing meals. And then they'll say things like, I don't know why I did that, or I couldn't remember that, or I couldn't focus, or um, I'm, I don't know why I, why I went and did this thing, or that was a big mistake. And it's because the frontal brain is your logical, rational thought, and it suffers with poor nutrition. And we especially know that those with ADD, ADHD, prison inmates, um, people who are overweight, those with mental decline, all have um, high, high needs for nutrition of the brain. And if they're not being fed well, and this includes children, if they're living on candy and junk food, we wonder why their behavior is irrational at times. And it's because the lower brain is in charge, not the upper brain. So brain food is important. We need to feed our brains. We need some protein with our meals. We need to cut down on the sugar and all those energy drinks, eat more frequently, eat good quality protein and vegetables and high quality fruits and um, rice and grains and yams and all those good foods. <clears throat> And we know that children, when they're given money and they get into these addictive habits with sugar, they go right down, 50% will buy more candy, 39% more gum, 34% will go down and get that soft drink, 33% will buy ice cream, um, fast food, 16%. This is what kids buy with their allowance. And so as parents, we have to know that when a child's brain is suffering from the nutritional lack, and that's why we like uh, protein shakes for breakfast for kids. We think that that really gives them energy for their school day. But if a child doesn't have enough energy in their brain, and we know this as adults too, we start craving things. We crave that chocolate. We crave something that will give us an energy boost to our brain. And at that point, the body doesn't care. It's happy to have whatever it can get. So starting the day off with a good breakfast that includes protein is important for adults and children. We don't want that poor focus and attention. Poor focus and attention is just brain deficiency of energy. And, uh, you know, we can, we can drug ourselves and try to do it that way. But we've seen kids really turn around with a good quality protein shake. If you buy a protein shake and you want to try that for your kids and you want to add a little almond butter to that and a tablespoon of almond oil or avocado oil, those oils really help the brain. Um, that can really have that child be very calm throughout the majority of their school day. But just read the label and make sure that 
protein shake isn't full of sugar. That's important. Sometimes the first ingredient is sugar. Now we want to look at this little gland in our brain called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is a fascinating part of our programming. It is there to test the waters of our life and tell the body how to react to what we're thinking. So I want to pretend that I've given you all a job. And the job that I've just given to you is I'm going to pay you, but your job is to drive across the United States in one week. Now, how do you react to that idea? You're going by yourself, by the way. You're on your own. How many of you say to yourself, that would be a grand adventure? I am so excited about that. That's like one of my bucket lists. I can't wait to do that. And you feel it energize your body. You're happy. You're excited. It's only two weeks away. You get to prepare for this. You're going to look at your maps and find a few fun things to do. How many of you would feel like that? And then how many of you, when I give you that job, would say, oh my goodness, my car could break down. What would happen if I broke down on the freeway? What would I do? What if I, what if I go to a rest area and there's weird people there or scary people and I feel concerned about myself? Or where am I gonna stay? How am I gonna plan for those hotels and motels? And by the way, I've got my dog with me. Where am I gonna stay? And this becomes a subject of anxiety. And you've got two weeks and you are just so anxious and so stressed out and so fearful about this trip that you're a mess by the end of the two weeks. In both cases, your body's going to feel a certain way. One case, it feels joyful and excited and energized. In the other case, you feel drained and stressed and anxious. And that is because of how you perceive that situation. Your hypothalamus listens to your perception and tells your body to react accordingly. So when you say to yourself, I'm so burnt out, I'm so stressed out, I'm so anxious, that's often your body's response to how you thought about your situation. And it's your hypothalamus's job to put your body into high alarm, high alert, let all those stress hormones flow, because it doesn't really differentiate between that scary situation and meeting a lion in the African jungle. They both have the same response. The problem is if you stay in that state for a long period of time, it really does burn your body out. So all of us have a life right now and that life can have challenges. We can maybe don't know what lies around the corner. We have to make a lot of decisions, but how we, how we mold our perceptions to that, and we have control here, we can mold our perceptions to say, yes, this is a challenge, but God is going to go before me. I'm going to put him in charge of this, certain things I don't have control over, and I'm going to meet this challenge in a state of peace and trust and faith, as opposed to, oh, this is all on me. I better, I better make sure of this and I better make sure of that. And I, I can't control this, but I'm certainly going to try to because I'm going to toss and turn all night over this trying to figure out how it's going to be done. If we approach it from that state, it's not only going to burn out our body, but it burns out our glandular system. Our adrenals become shot. Our thyroid becomes stressed. Our, our sex, sexual glandular system stresses out. And then we wonder what's wrong with our hormones and we have to go to the doctor and figure out how to get our hormones straightened out. A lot of this is definitely under the power of your perception of your life. So here's my challenge to you with this. Pretend you're in an easy chair. It's the most comfortable chair there is. It's made especially for you. And on the television is your life. And you're able to put some spins on that life and make some decisions for that life to the best of your ability. But the whole time you're making those decisions, your mind is set in that easy chair, in that place of safety, that place of comfort, that place of faith where you are putting God in charge of the things you can't control. 
and you're making the best decisions possible for your life from a place of peace and a place of comfort, knowing that and trusting that God is going to take care of some things. What's better, doing that or stressing out and totally having those circumstances control you? I want you to ask yourself that question because sometimes we have to actually say it out loud. We start to go into this anxious hyper mode. Sometimes we have to stop. And I did that one day. I stopped and said, okay, what's better? Is it better for me to meet this situation all stressed out and hyper? Or should I just get on the phone, make the phone call, make the arrangement I need to do, and still have a peaceful day that I can still enjoy? So this is big, and it can really, I think, shorten our lives to become really stressed out within the decision making we have to make every day versus making it from a state of peace. It's huge. This is huge. It'll have a huge impact on your health, but it's a conscious decision because kind of the natural response is to get stressed out. We have to make a conscious decision saying, no, I'm not going to go there. I refuse to go there. It's not going to do me any good. So play with this a little bit and see if this can be a life changer. It truly can. So, and this is a bit of a, a conclusion to this, our whole endocrine system. This is your hormonal system. It is a responder to toxins, to stress, to emotions, to trauma, to our diet, to people, to pets. That's why they have emotional support pets because pets cause you to have emotional relaxation. A lot of people feel better. But, and that is a great thing. I'm, I'm saying all, all pets in a way are emotional support pets, that's for sure. But a lot of this is truly our responsibility of transforming our mind. And it, 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 it has to be a conscious thing that we have to practice. It's not something we just grab instantly. But from day to day, if we're conscious of our response and say, no, it's not gonna do me any good to go to that anxiety place. Usually when we have anxiety, it means that an action has to happen, but we haven't completed the action, and that's why we're anxious. So we'll get into more of this in the emotional section, but the question to ask ourselves is, what is my emotion telling me to do? What do I need to do to get that emotion to go to a place of peace? And sometimes instead of thinking about it so much, we need to get up and do the action and put that emotion to bed. <clears throat> Here's some other interesting things. We're gonna have some bits and pieces all over the place here. This is called, this is from Carolyn Leaf. It's talking about lying. And it's interesting when I hear um, statistics on TV, it's like 90% of people are telling lies every day and things like this. I don't know if I agree with that totally. I know that a lot of people are not, um, and are conscious of this and actually walking in truth. But it's interesting that this has an impact on our body. And, it, you know, it's we don't really get away with anything that's a sin. It all comes back and causes some sort of upset toward us. But according to Carol and Leaf, it puts us into the second phase of stress. There's three phases of stress, mild, moderate, and high. So this, if we're living a lie or speaking lies, it's actually creating a stress response in our hypothalamus and in our body that we might not be aware of. We just know we're tense or we're anxious or that sort of thing. But in this state, then this is the interesting part. We don't even release our toxins properly. We actually hold toxins up in our head when we are in this state where we're not in a state of integrity. So um, if, if you're interested in good, healthy detoxification of toxins, um, we need to walk in integrity and truth. And here's a wonderful verse. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bury me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people who read that verse would say, that's a nice spiritual verse. Of course we shouldn't lie. But when we actually find out from research that that hurts our body, whatever's hurting our spirit is hurting our body also. Um, we don't always think to that degree or process this to that degree. And I just wanted to bring that to the degree that it actually is harming us on all levels. This is Carolyn Leaf. She's an amazing Australian researcher. And she talks about 
forming neurons in your brain. Neurons are brain cells. Did you know you form a new brain cell and new brain cells every time you learn a new task? That's why at every age you are, it is a wonderful thing to learn a new task. Anytime you stop learning, you stop your brain from growing. You, you stop new cells from being made. So if I learn German at my age, what's going to happen? I'm going to start forming new brain cells. If I want to learn a new gardening practice, I'm going to form new brain cells. So that's exciting. I have a client who's, gosh, she must be in her upper 80s. She still works as an accountant. She does a crossword puzzle every day in English and one every day in German because she was born in Germany and she knows German. She is sharp because she exercises her brain on a daily basis to learn new things. So I wanted you to look at the picture of the two trees. If, if you're on a phone where you can't see this well, one tree is beautiful. It's full of beautiful leaves. The other tree, um, is more of, we're going to call this a thorn bush. I, I didn't get a good picture of a thorn bush, but let's pretend it's a big tree full of thorns. It doesn't have leaves on it. And to the right, we see a neuron or a brain cell. When you have healthy, positive thought processes, your brain forms neuron, neuron branches and clusters that look like the healthy tree. When you are focused on negative things, like what you should have done differently in the past, or what could negatively go wrong in your life today, and you're obsessed with that, or what, what the problems of the future are going to be, and you're obsessed with that, your neurons won't form these healthy tree formations. They form something that looks like a thorn bush. So traumas can form thorn bushes. Now, as we get more scriptural knowledge and we can apply healthy thought processes and healthy truths to these old things and we start feeling empowered and we start realizing we can change these, change can also happen in your brain. Those little ugly thorn bushes full of the traumas and the negatives will start turning into the beautiful trees again. So we don't have to call ourselves traumatized our whole life or ruined by something our whole life. We can actually change that and change our brain. Change our brain, change our life. We've heard that. That's exciting. We have power over these things. One of these healing principles is the principle of dumping baggage. Anybody out there not have baggage? Anybody? All right, we all are dragging some. Here's a nice example. My husband was nice enough to pose for this picture. He's going up a hill with a bunch of baggage. How many of you would like to go through life dragging 10 suitcases behind you everywhere you go? It would weigh us down. It would, it would take away a lot of life experiences because this baggage is always present. And so I want to learn a lesson from David. David became one of the greatest kings in Israel. He was a shepherd and he was chosen by God. He was anointed by a prophet to actually leave the sheep. God saw something amazing in this boy. This boy had already killed a lion and a bear by himself. He was an expert with a slingshot. So he comes and is brought to Israel. King Saul is king at the time and they are fighting a group called the philistines and the philistines have a giant in their midst this guy is how tall is this guy mark eight or nine feet tall he's huge huge guy said his spear was like a weaver's beam so goliath comes up against and said this war will be over if you'll just send somebody up against me if i defeat him then we'll declare ourselves the winner. And if you defeat Goliath, you declare yourselves the winner. And everybody stood there. All these amazing soldiers stood there doing nothing. And here's David saying, are you going to let this uncircumcised Philistine come up against the armies of the living God? Who is this guy? And so he had some guts and he actually said what he thought. 
And so they outfitted David with armor. And he was so encumbered by the armor that he threw it all off. And he said, just give me a, my slingshot. And he picked up a few smooth stones. And the, of course, the giant laughed at him. Just before David went up to fight against the giant, it says David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line. Why would such an insignificant thing about dumping his baggage be put in the Bible? And I think this is one of the pro most profound things I have ever read. If we have battles in our life and we're carrying a bunch of baggage behind us, it becomes very difficult to fight. David went after the biggest battle in his life so unencumbered. He didn't wear all that stuff. He, he, he got rid of all the baggage he could possibly get rid of. And he took the weapon he was comfortable with and he went up against this giant in faith. He threw his slingshot, he threw it in such a way that that stone embedded in that giant's forehead and it killed him dead. He, he fell over and David finished him off in whatever way needed to happen at that point. But this is an important concept for us. I went to the beach one day and I saw a, a bronze, um, a, a beautiful bronze statue and it was only about six inches high. It was a man straining forward and behind him a string of probably 20 different baggages that he was straining to try to move forward, dragging these things. And I wished I would have bought that at that point because it was a really powerful principle of how dragging the past behind us encumbers us in such a way if you have to reach up every day and take your imaginary scissors and cut the rope to this cut it we might have to do it on a daily basis because some of us are so used to looking back and living with this baggage it's hard to walk forward when you're looking backward and i remember a, a dr phil episode i love this where he actually put baggage on everybody with a rope and he said, I want you to cart it around. And people were walking around his studio with this baggage. And he said, when you're ready, let it go. And some people let it go right away. But other people were still going. And finally, they let it go. And one man still was carting it around. He wasn't quite ready. He wasn't quite ready. And they waited on him. They waited on him on the air. And Dr. Phil did some talking, the camera went back to him, he was still carting the baggage. It just took him some time to let it go. And then that's representative of us. Some of us are addicted to our baggage. And all we can do is sit and look at it. And maybe it's because we're horrified of it. I don't know what it is, but we've got to take our imaginary scissors and maybe we have to walk around our backyard with our baggage. Maybe we have to do something very symbolic. But the sooner we're able to take a lesson from David, the better to let our baggage go. And what did Paul say? The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he says, one thing I do, forgetting the things from behind and moving forward, letting the things go. Paul, Paul approved of murder of the Christians. He stood by and held the coats while, while Christians were stoned. And he did a 180. He was totally converted. He had a lot of baggage. He could have said, oh, how can I do anything? I have to keep looking back at my baggage. He says, the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, the one thing, this wasn't a multitask. It was something he probably did every morning. The one thing I do, leaving this stuff behind. And sometimes we have to start our day out and say, I'm going to live a day without baggage. I'm going to let it go. Here's another one. This is an interesting one too. Getting rid of ants. How many of you have ants? <laughs> ants are automatic negative thoughts that tend to hold you in a negative place in your life. So we might say, here's an example. I'm going to give an example that Dr. Amon gave, and I give this example a lot. This is an example of a woman named Annie. Annie was probably 70 years old. And she always wanted to get married. And she said, well, I'll probably, he was, she was talking to Dr. Amen, the brain doctor. And she said, I, I don't think I'll ever get married because I'm 70. 
And he said, well, is that true? And she says, well, I, I think so. I'm, I'm 70 and I'm not married. And he said, yes, but can you absolutely positively know that that's true? And she still said, well, I think so. I mean, I can't sign a paper on it, but I think it's true. And then he said to her, well, how do you feel and react when you believe that thought? because you know the, the history of your life isn't written yet. So how do you feel and react if you believe, I want this really bad, but it'll probably never happen for me. And she had to acknowledge that it made her feel depressed. And a lot of us feel depressed because we're believing our automatic negative thoughts. We're just putting the ending of the story on before the story's complete. And then Dr. Amen said something very provocative to her. He said, how would you feel if you didn't believe that thought and you actually believed what you want to happen, that you will get married and you will have a joyful life and that is in your future. And she said, I would feel amazing. And he said, well, wouldn't it be better to feel amazing and put a positive outlook on your future than to feel depressed and put a negative outlook out there? And it's worth thinking about this because automatic negative thoughts come into our head all the time that tell us this won't happen, this can't happen, it's too late for me for this, or this has been my experience, so I guess my experience is gonna dictate my future. And if we entertain those automatic negative thoughts, they are a prescription for depression. So look at your depression scale today. A lot of our depression is the entertainment of automatic negative thoughts. Put a new ending on the story that hasn't completed itself yet. It doesn't take any more energy to put the great ending on than it does to put the negative ending on and depression it just saps our brain of those happy neurotransmitters and we become more depressed. So say no to automatic negative thoughts. Ask yourself, who would I be without that thought? And what is the positive thought I need to put in its place? Remember the positive thought makes healthy, beautiful trees out of the neurons in your brain while the negative thoughts make thorn bushes in your brain and trauma. So, I know I'm going over a lot today, but these are really important to work with our mental health. We always want to stop that knee jerk response. Stuff comes at us and we just react. So we want to really take this, take this into consideration to not be conformed to the world, to not have the knee jerk response, renew our mind to these, stop taking in the automatic negative thoughts, control our life from our easy chair so that we can be peaceful and let the peace of God rule in our hearts and not something else. This will lead to more balance in our body, our glandular system, and our mind. And um, we want to be future forward. Here is Paul. Here's the actual verse I was talking about. Brethren, one thing I do. And for some of us, this has to be the one thing. We have to do this before we can move ahead properly. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Sometimes we have to talk to ourselves out loud and say, by golly, today I'm going to focus on today and the future, and I'm cutting the rope to those things. Maybe you have to have a ceremony where you go out and you you bury something, you know, you, you paint your problems on rocks and then you bury the rocks and you do something symbolic to make a powerful statement to your brain. So what is the healthy thinking? Let's make sure we keep reading what God says about us. I love this, Psalm 16, three, as for the saints. Who's a saint? A saint is basically a child of God. He calls us saints. They're not special people who did more than other people. I know in the Catholic Church we have saints, but God calls all his people saints who are following him with that integrity, that wanting to follow him with our whole being. And none of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes, but the fact we have an intention there, that's enough for God to call us his saints who are in the earth. 
And it says they are the majestic ones. How many of you think of yourself as majestic ones? How many call yourself majestic ones? In whom all is all my delight. That's how God thinks about you. If you're thinking about yourself in a different way, let's cut the rope on that today and leave that in the past and call ourselves the majestic ones. I am the majestic one that God delights in. That feels good, doesn't it? Let's inhale that in and exhale out the stuff that is not that, that we've told ourselves. You are to reign as a king in this life. How do you do that? You do that by seeing yourself as God sees you and your thinking and behavior will start to align to this. Yes, it can take some time. Yes, those automated, automatic thoughts seem ready to jump in the minute we wanna make a healthy change. But you know, you know about those now, they're ants. Automatic negative thoughts are ants. What do you do with ants? Step on them, step on them. <laughs> That's what I do. So it's a cause we're celebrating. If you need help, if you need help with this, Speak boldly and affirm who you are. Let's watch Jessica do this. We're going to let a two-year-old, I actually I think she's almost three. We're going to let a three-year-old teach us. So here she is. And let's listen to how she has learned to affirm herself. And uh, we'll start that. Look, I can be a shark now. My whole house is Great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allison. I like my mom. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my, I like my hair. I like my haircuts. I like my pajamas. I like my stuff. I like my rooms. I like my coat. My whole house is great. I can do anything good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do anything good. Better than anyone. Better than anyone. <laughs> what if you started your day like that? How would your day go? This this little gal has something amazing that she has learned. Did you notice at one point she claps? When you clap, you snap your brain out of those negative mindsets. And maybe we need to walk around clapping a little bit and getting our brain out of those negative mindsets. So that's a lesson from Jessica. I got permission from her dad to show this. And uh, she is amazing in her affirmation and when it says let the weak say I am strong this is the way we have to say I am strong we have to say it with emotion and purpose and boldness and we're gonna we're gonna do a little more of this next week because I see our time is up but if anything is left with you today I want you to speak with boldness over your life take every morning speak over your circumstances Watch for those little ants that want to creep into your brain, throw them down on the floor and step on them and put the positive thought in its place. Don't let people tell you negative things about yourself. Speak up, defend yourself. And I want to open this up to any final comments. Anybody have any comments or any takeaways? Would you like to say something now? And uh, happy to hear anything you want to share. Well, I would love to say, Sylvia, this has been so, so good. <laughs> I would love to show this, show this at my um, women's retreat this year, especially that little video of that little girl. My God, that was just like, it just, you couldn't help but smile. And yeah. Yes, I need to take my day on like that. You know, I'm a pretty positive person anyway, but it just really perked me up. And I'm like, we need to take the day on like that. And those thoughts that try to come at us of situations that we have no power over, to speak over them. It's just a good reminder to speak over them, right? Because you're changing the atmosphere and your brain of how you see and perceive. That's right. And, and I love what you said, Cheryl. You know, it's interesting that if we started our day like Jessica, we might have less automatic negative thoughts as time goes by. Those thoughts could be replaced by thoughts of empowerment and our authority and that we are God's majestic ones and we are gonna happen to life. We're gonna happen to life instead of life happening to us. <laughs>
Anybody else? Thank you so much, Sylvia. Oh, thank you, Esther. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, it's so amazing. It's transforming. Good, good. I'm hoping. I'm God, God's word powerful. All I'm doing is sharing those pearls, and that's, that's the transforming part of this. It gets me excited, so I'm hoping it gets you excited. Thank you for being obedient. Oh, thank you. All right, everyone, I'm going to sign out for the day. I pray you all have a good week, that you're all bold warriors going forth, you Superman and Wonder Women, and have a great week. Um, let others see and learn from you and how, and how you speak and take on your day. And I just bless all of you. May God bless you all. And uh, we'll see you later. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all.